Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Sycamore Baptist Church this morning on this beautiful day. Um, I want to uh, bring it to your attention a few announcements that we have. Lots of activities going on. Uh, as summer gets uh, kicked off this week. Um, I hope that everyone has a, a wonderful Memorial Day as we remember those um, who gave their lives for our freedom uh, this weekend. We do want to um, let you know about the 2nd of June, which is this Thursday night um, at Chick-fil-A. We're going to be having a spirit night, so everybody come on out to Chick-fil-A from 6 to 8 um, this Thursday and just say spirit night, and you can, when you order, and part of the proceeds of that are going to go to help uh, fund our mission trips this summer. Um, share it around with your friends. We've posted it on Facebook. Share it on Facebook. Uh, let all of your families and friends know to come out that night. You can go through the drive through and say Spirit Night, or you can come in and visit with us while you're there, 6 to 8 this Thursday night. <clears throat> Next uh, Sunday morning, we'll be having our uh, regularly scheduled business meeting. Um, and then the following Monday, on June the 6th, our students will be leaving to go to Infuge. And we're going to be leaving at 9 o'clock in the morning. And I hope that you will make um, just... Keep us in your prayers as we go to um, Mobile, and we're going to go serve in the community down there in Mobile and work um, with, with families and children and work on houses. And so we've got a lot of exciting events planned for the students that week. So I hope that you'll keep us in your prayers. There are a lot of other announcements in your bulletin. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so keep that handy as you pray this week and the prayer announcements at the bottom. Uh, just remember those this week. I wanted to read from Psalm chapter 90 this morning. Lord, through all the generations, you have been our home. Before the mountains were born, before you gave birth to the earth and the world, from beginning to end, you are God. Isn't that a comforting thought that the Lord is sovereign over all, in all time and all places? Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for today. I thank you uh, that as we celebrate this Memorial Day, we can remember that you are sovereign from beginning to end. And there is nothing that happens in our world that doesn't pass through your hand. And Lord, I pray that you would uh, just be with those who are remembering um, today, those ones that they love that have gone on and given their lives the ultimate sacrifice for our freedom. Lord, we do thank you for the freedom that we have in this country. We thank you that we can freely sit here today and worship you and sing songs of praise to you. And Lord, that's uh, a gift from you, and may we never take it for granted. Thank you so much for this body of believers that's gathered together today. I pray for our pastor as he brings your word to us later, that, that he would speak the truth to us, and we'd be challenged and changed because we've encountered your word today. We love you, Lord, and we want to honor you with everything we do and say. We pray this in the beautiful name of Jesus. Amen. Thirteen folds. Each fold a reminder of a life spent in service. Service to country. Service to people. Protecting God-given rights, preserving freedoms. Thirteen folds. At each fold, we remember the friends and family left behind. The mothers and fathers, sisters and brothers, sons and daughters left to pick up the pieces. Thirteen folds. And we remember the scriptures. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. Each one loved greatly. We also remember that blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. And today we pray, God be near those who need comfort. So, draw close to those who mourn. Make your presence and appreciation known. Let this church be a safe place, a comforting place. And let us honor those who have given their lives 
in service to this country. Thirteen folds to signify a life given to service. Amen. Thank God for if we celebrate this Memorial Day for all those men and women who gave their lives that we might enjoy the freedom that we enjoy today. Let's stand together. We sing the battle hymn of the Republic.
you walked in and I may have missed you if I did I hope that before you leave you're able to get one of these little poppies um, and some of you may be real wondering why you were given a poppy by the way this was for anybody and I noticed that there's very few guys there's very few men that ever uh, wanted to take it from me <laughs> am I that ugly I mean <laughs> uh, but you may be wondering why you got a poppy this morning well, for us, one of the things I, I, I wanted to do, it's a special service, it's more Memorial Day service, and I know uh, the generations today probably think Memorial Day is pretty much about barbecue, family, friends, and a very long weekend with a free Monday off. But for, most, for many of us, we understand Memorial Day is so much more than that. And unfortunately, some of the, um, the meaning behind Memorial Day and what, what's, why it's set aside on our calendar, why it's so meaningful, why it's so special, has been just kind of uh, put on the, the burner, so to speak. But you, were, you received a poppy uh, today because uh, it has some significance. Years ago, decades ago, uh, this poppy was one of the flowers that was known as the remembrance flower, and there's a reason for that. And I want to share just a little bit about that. Uh, a Canadian doctor in World War I, John McRae, he was in battle, and he lost his best friend, Alexis. He was a lieutenant in that, in that war. And there was no clergy around. And so, because there was no clergy, John had to do, officiate the funeral himself of his best friend. And now, amongst that tragic moment, how emotional that would have been, not only the, the, the carnage that he had witnessed already, all the bloodshed he had witnessed, but losing his best friend on the battlefield as well and having to preside over that funeral. He looked out as he did that funeral and he noticed something about the makeshift graves all around. Though the land was worn torn with battle, there was something that was growing, and that was poppies. The first thing that grew back, John McRae noticed, were poppy flowers. And on these graves there were poppy flowers springing up. 
So he coined a, a very now famous poem called In Flanders Field. I'd like to read that poem for you now. In Flanders Fields, the poppies blow between the crosses row on row that mark our place. And in the sky, the larks still bravely singing fly. Scarce heard amid the guns below, we are the dead. Short days ago we lived, felt dawn, saw sunset glow. Loved and were loved, and now we lie in Flanders Field. Take up our quarrel with the foe. To you, from failing hands, we throw the torch. Be yours to hold it high. If you break faith with us who die, we shall not sleep, though poppies grow in Flanders Fields. That poem became very famous, and a teacher in, in France and a teacher in America because of this poem, decided to start selling poppies, imitation poppies, to raise funds for those families that have lost loved ones in the war. This became a flower that families would take and they would go to the cemetery in the graveyard and they would adorn that family member that was lost to war with these flowers. Guys, I just wanted to try to share a little bit of history with us and, and give us a little bit of visual. Because today we, we do take a moment to honor those fallen men and women who, who gave it all, their very life, so that you and I can have that barbecue and can enjoy those moments and can sit in a building like this one and worship God freely. It's a freedom we, we get to enjoy. And, and, and we need to stop because some of us are very affected by what I'm talking about. Because we've lost an uncle, a brother, a sister, a, a father, a grandfather, a mother, a grandmother. In a war, in a battle, somewhere. Some of us are reminded that we have family members right now currently serving. So hopefully you'll take this home and remember this. And, and I want to share this as well. The video we opened up with had a scripture, and we're going to kind of go over that scripture. And I want to explain it to you as you think about it. It's, it's in John chapter 15, 12 through 17 that we'll be in. This idea that there's no greater love that can be displayed than, a, than if a, a person lays down his life for his friend, right? You heard that in the video. Now, I know that when we, listen, we read that, we, we, we today can think of, well, there was men and women who had the kind of love that was willing to fight, bleed, and die. I, I thought about it. I've, I've never been there. I, I've never been in the trenches or the foxholes or the barricades or holding a weapon next to my brother or in, in arms or sister in arms. I've never known what it was like to be, to hear the, and feel the tremble of cannon fire or bullets whizzing by. So what, what I want to think about it this morning is, as we honor them and their sacrifice, their love, perhaps God has a lot to say about us too as Christians. You see, they, they fought a war, right? They fought battles and wars, these, these ones we honor today. Friends, we, we're Christians. We're in a battle and a war too. We fight every day a real war that's raging. A spiritual warfare for the souls of many across the globe. We fight for a cause as well. The question I want us to pose is, Christian... Though we are soldiers in God's army, do we have the kind of love that the Bible des describes? Or the kind of love that those men and women died with? I, I hope that this morning as we walk through the scriptures, that it challenges us to think, wait a second, what kind of love do I have for, for my comp companion, my family, my friend, my brother and sister in Christ? So look with me 
in John 15, 12 through 17, this is my commandment. This is Jesus' farewell discourse, as we call it. He says, this is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends, for all that I have heard from my Father I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you, that you should go and bear fruit, and that your fruit should abide, so that whatever you ask in the Father's, ask the Father in my name, he may give it to you. These things I command you so that you will love one another. Love one another. Is that what? Now, I know when we look at this scripture, we like to pull it. A lot of people like to pull it out of context and, and speak only of the example, the prime example we have in Jesus Christ, right? That he laid down his life for his friends. We'll talk about that in a moment. And that's true. But Jesus is saying, listen, I, I showed you the I'm showing you the example but you, as a Christian, love each other this way. And so that's, the, that's what we need to grab our, uh, wrap our minds around. How are we loving one another right now? Uh, let us walk through some of this. Verse 12. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. The words of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ says, in his final, basically his final discourse, he gives us a command. Love one another. Love one another. Now all of us understand that we who are saved by Jesus Christ's love are marked by His love, aren't we? And of course we understand being marked by Christ's love that we should show His love to others. We, we get that. You don't have to have some seminary degree to know that when Christ loves you and saves you, you're supposed to display that love to others. Amen? We know that. But if we're honest, is that the reality? Do we find it sometimes that we're not as loving as we should be to our brothers and sisters in Christ? Do we find it sometimes that our brothers and sisters in Christ aren't as loving to us sometimes? I think if we've lived long enough, we can all say there's been moments in our life where I personally have been uh, not as loving as I should be to a Christian brother or sister, and somebody else who's a Christian brother or sister has not been as loving as they should to be, be to me. So the reality is, uh, we, we need this commandment from Jesus Christ because it's not easy to love one another. Now, some, some people can call to mind right now. Don't call out any names, by the way. <laughs> but we, we can think immediately, I say, is there someone that's really hard for you to love? And you're like, oh, wait a second, not just someone. I got, right? Like, you could recall somebody in your life, somebody even that you probably go to church with, that you find a little more difficult to love than someone else. A little more trying he, try, he or she tries your patience a little more. They, they grade on you a little more. You're, you find your nerves being pressed in certain ways you didn't know they could be pressed when you're around that person. They, they're just a little more difficult to love. And Jesus says, but I'm giving you a commandment because I know you're not going to do this naturally. You've got to, you've got to, you've got to work at this. It, it's going to take some effort, right? It takes effort to love. It takes work. It takes time. It takes an investment to love. Amen? Anybody in a marriage that's a, that's a healthy, good marriage knows that's true. It's not always the reality that we love one another the way Christ commands. And how does Christ command us to love one another? Well, He qualifies it. I love it. I mean, I love Jesus. I love His Word. It's just amazing. Like, He's not going to leave it up for your, your, your or my... Uh, opinions like love one another well that can be anything right i can figure out that i can i can take that love if i if i'm defining that love it might go just to certain a certain level but 
but that's it. I'm going to love you at a level seven, that 10 you're never going to reach. I, I, I can kind of define that myself. And she says, no, 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 no. I'm defining what that love looks like. And that love looks like this. I'm commanding you. I'm commanding you that you love one another. How? As I have loved you. Oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. Now, Jesus, you didn't have to go that far. <laughs> As if it wasn't already hard enough. Now you're asking me to love my brother and sister in Christ as you have loved me. You just took it not just to the 10, you took it to the 100. You, you blew it through the roof now. You, you're, you're saying that I've got to love people the way you love, the way you showed love? Absolutely. Oh, it's not easy, but through Christ we can do it. And he commands us to do so. Love others the way Jesus loved others. As we read scripture, we can see Jesus was full of amazing love. Whether he was helping the blind and healing them or helping the sick and, and healing the sick or, or feeding the hungry or rescuing the demon possessed or sharing the gospel with others or sitting down and taking time to teach people God's truths. Jesus was full of God's love and displayed God's love perfectly in Scripture. He loved, um, he loved so much perfectly that He just wanted us to love Him back. There are so many wonderful examples of Jesus loving the downtrodden, the outcasts of, our, of the societies. He showed love beautifully. He, was not, he did not show it pre with any prejudice. He just loved people. He loved them in truth. He loved them with mercy and grace, but also with a firm hand and a firm word. But there's also another way Christ shows love. Verse 13. He says, Love one another as I, ha I have loved you. And he says, Greater love has no one than this. But let me tell you the, the, the extreme pinnacle, the, the example, the perfect example of what this love looks like. That when I tell you to love the way I'm loving you, Jesus says, this is what you do. It's as great a love as no one than this. That someone laid down his life for his friends. That Christian brother and sister, that that's the kind of love we should have one, one for another. That, that we have this love, this such beautiful passionate, unconditional love that we're willing to lay down our life for our friend. Now, now I think about this. Jesus is saying friends, but when he laid down his life, the people he was laying down his life were not very friendly. Amen? They were, they were whipping him, beating him, spitting on him, calling him names and all sorts of things, nailing him to a cross. And yet he laid down his life for his friends. Friends, you and I sometimes need to love even those around us, our Christian brothers and sisters that sometimes aren't very friendly. Amen? He says, love the way I've loved. Greater, greater love there's, has no one than this. Lay down your life for your friends. He, he showed us, Jesus showed us the greatest love. He laid down his life for us. He, we needed to be rescued from ourselves. We were in a situation, yes, we were helpless. To borrow a military phrase, we were POWs, prisoner of this world. This world and its sin had its grasp on us, and we had us captured and, and in chains, and there was nothing we could do to break ourselves from it. We could try to be as good as we wanted. It didn't matter. We could never be good enough. And so Jesus knowing we were powerless, gave his life, laid it down for us. Jesus Christ risked everything to save us. And I use that word risk as in fact that I would understand Jesus risked nothing. <laughs> but the idea that he was willing to lay it down. Now, I want you to think about this love, and, and I try to, I'm going to try to articulate it, and I'm just praying the Holy Spirit takes my feeble words and really impresses upon our heart. The magnitude of it. We were more important than Jesus' comfort. Jesus could have lived a comfortable life if he wanted to. But he didn't. He wanted to lay down his life for his friends. 
He chose the cross over his comfort. We were more important than Jesus' pride. He chose to be insulted for us. He chose to be displayed on a cross naked and exposed, humiliated for us. We were more important than his reputation. Christ chose to be mocked, ridiculed, called names for us. I mean, you can go on down that list. We sometimes choose not to love, choose not to be this, have this sacrificial love because we're worried about ourselves. Maybe that love will cost us time. Maybe that love will cost us money. Maybe that love will cost us pain. By the way, sometimes we love and it's emotionally painful. Maybe sometimes, you know, that love will cost us, cost us so much hurt. And so we'll choose not to love. And Jesus didn't do that. Jesus says, I love you. So I will lay down my life for you. I'm not concerned about my pride or my comfort or even my own body. When it comes to loving you, I'll place my body down on a cross. and be, Let it be nailed. And let my body die for you. And this is, this is so, the word I want to say is gravitas. It's so weighty. It's so, so heavy to think about it. It it's even feels like almost hard to breathe when you think about the fact that Jesus is calling you and I, commanding you and I to love this way. This way. And, and I think we, we, we don't want to, not deep down. We, we want to love more conveniently. We, we want to maybe give a little bit of money when we should be given time. Or we don't want to invest as much as we should invest because we know what it's going to cost and we don't want to pay that cost. And Jesus says, no, 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 you've got to love this way. Commanding you to love this way. To be willing to set your will, your wants, your ways, everything about you down for the sake of others. Will you love that way? None of us. And I know we've been, I, I was asked this question years ago. I said, would, you know, if you were faced with a decision to stand for Jesus... And if you did, be killed for that stand or not, what would you do? I pray with everything I have, I'll stand. Amen? Now, none of us know when we get in that situation what we'll do. I pray we all would stand. But here's a situation when, when, when Christ calls us to love in the way he loves. What if loving your brother and sister in Christ may get you killed? Would you still do it? Now, I want to say, I pray I would. But I don't know. You may have said something ugly to me yesterday, and I might have, have something else on my mind. I'm just kidding. But we are kind of fickle that way, aren't we? How we react sometimes, how emotional we can be. I love you yesterday, but you said something today, and I don't quite love you as much. Now, we can say with words the same Oh, I love you, I love you, I love you with words. But our actions speak volumes. I, I know that I've been in church a long time and I've had people tell me they love me. And to some of those people, I believe it. Absolutely. But in ministry, I've had people in my life say they love me and I watched them ignore me. Anybody ever been there? So I don't think so. And the same thing for me is, like, I, I'm just saying, being real as I can be, there's been moments in my life where I'm like, I just don't want to talk to that person. I want to avoid that person. Anybody ever been there? And, and he says, no, 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 you've got to love that person. That's, that's your family. That's your brother and sister in Christ. You've got to be willing to lay down your life for that person. Right now, at this very moment, don't point fingers. Just gaze around the room. Do you love that person that you're sitting next to? Well, probably, because it's probably family. What about that person in front of you? What about the one behind you? What about the run, one five rows? What about the one, you know, six rows away? Do you love them enough to be willing that it would cost you time? 
perhaps inconvenience, perhaps money, perhaps your, your comfortableness, perhaps your own pride. Do you love them enough to lay down your will, your want, your way for theirs? Would we be willing to lay down our life for our brothers or sisters? This is love. This is love Jesus commands us to. He says, you know, he says, greater love has no one than this. Lay it down. And if we're honest, none of us have mastered this depth of love. The truth is, none of us have mastered this depth of love. It, 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 it's, it's extremely difficult to love like this. Right now, if Jesus asked us to lay down our lives for that person, we would honestly have to say something different. There might be one or two or a few that you would lay down your life gladly for, but they're probably your children, your wife, your spouse, your parents, your grandchildren. Those who would quickly say, yes, I would do that. But what about the person who's not biologically related to you, but spiritually related to you, amen? Would you lay down your life for that person? And we say, Jesus, if you asked me that today, I'd have to respectfully decline. I don't think I could do that. So let's, let's be convinced. If that's our honest answer, let's be uh, c convicted all the more what Christ says in verse 14 and on. You are my friends if you do what I command you. Uh, very simple. We've been reading in First John. This is the same language John has. He's like, look, you know, I'm gonna call you. I call you friends. My friends are those who follow my word. Those are my friends. Because do what I command you to do. He said, and it's also like, look, Jesus, but I love you. I am your friend. Well, then do what I command you to do. Be willing to lay down your life. Well, I can't do that. But you, but you just said you're my friend. Lay down your life. Move on to 15. No longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what his master's doing, but I have called you friends. Now, I love this verse. Because Jesus says, I, I, I'm not calling you. Yes, he's our master and our Lord. Amen. Jesus is Lord. He says, but not, no longer do I call you a servant as I am your Lord, but I'm going to call you friends. Why am I going to call you friends? Because of this. For all that I have heard from my Father, I've made known to you. So unlike an earthly king, or maybe like, let's break it down to an earthly boss, where you just are being told, go clean the dishes, go do this, go do that, go do that. And you might want to ask, well, why? I don't have to tell you why. I'm your boss. And though Jesus has every right as Lord to do that, he says, I'm calling you friends because what I'm doing is I've made known everything that the Father teaches, and I'm telling you, and you're learning it. He says, for all that I heard from my Father, I made known to you. I'm teaching you these things. So that you'll know why this commandment is so important. I find that's one of the important things for the generations coming up. When I was growing up, it was different. My generation, my dad could tell me what to do, and I dare not ask why. Some of y'all know. Ask why, that's just, oh, that's just two more licks for you, buddy. You know, don't ask why. My mom would tell me, and I wouldn't ask why. I would go to school, they would give me an assignment, and I wouldn't ask why. But this generation wants to know the why. But you know what the amazing thing is? When you give them the why and the reason, oh, that makes sense. Jesus said, here's the why, here's the reason, right? When we understand that Jesus' commandments aren't burdensome, right, that, the, that they're good for us, that, that, it, that he's doing all of this out of love, we'll want to follow it. Oh, okay, I get it. This is for my good. Well, I want to follow that then if it's for my good. Says, I call you friends. That I, for all that I've heard from my Father, I've made known to you. Look at verse 16. You didn't choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should bear fruit. Go and bear fruit. Jesus died for us, though yet he had never seen, well, physically seen our face. Like he's seen our face because he's God, amen? But Jesus died on the cross knowing one day you'd be born. Jesus didn't just die for those that watched him hang 2,000 years ago. Jesus died for everybody here today, too. And you know what? If the Lord tarries another hundred years, guess what? He died for them, too. 
You didn't choose me, but I chose you, and, and I did something. Not only did, I, not only did I save you, but I've appointed you for something. I've given you a task, a specific task. You're appointed to go and bear fruit. Now that in itself is pretty challenging. I'm going to read on in verse 16. And that your fruit should abide so that whatever you ask in the Father's, in, in, ask the Father in my name, he may give it to you. Now people love to take those type of verses out of context. That I can ask anything in Jesus' name. He says, I'm going to give it. I'm going to get it. If I ask for that Lamborghini, well, folks, I tried that. It never happened. I never had a Lamborghini in my yard. That's not what he's talking about. He says, I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should abide. Jesus' great act of love was in choosing us. When he marched up Golgotha's hill, he was making a choice for us. When he stretched out his hands on the cross and laid it, let his hands be nailed and his feet be nailed, he was choosing us. When he died, he was choosing us. When he rose from the grave, guess what? He was choosing us. And he chose us for a purpose. We were appointed for a specific task, to go and bear fruit, and the fruit abide in us. Jesus says that his friends know his word. That's what he's saying in Scripture. You, you know what I've, what, what I've taught. You know my Father's word. You know my word. And you know, my friends, you know how to follow my word. And when you know his word and follow his word, can I tell you there's a natural outcrop of fruit? When you read and study the Word of God, when you were saved, amen, you need to be saved first because you received the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit be then begins, who is God, begins to reveal God's truth to you through His Word, and you begin to learn God's Word, and you begin to follow God's Word, and when you do, fruit comes. Such a sweet passage. What a friend we have in Jesus. What, if we're his friends, he said, we, we learn from him. His friends learn from him. His friends follow his word. And his friends go and bear much fruit. Here's the promise Jesus is saying. If my friends will listen to me and follow me, if they will read my word and follow my, what my word teaches, they're going to bear fruit, which means they'll be in my Father's will. When you study the word of God and you follow the word of God, you're pleasing the Father. Because you're in His will. When you bear fruit, you're pleasing the Father. So when you're bearing fruit and you ask for things of the Father, you know what you're going to be asking for? His will be done. And He'll answer those. The problem is a lot of Christians never read His Word. Or rarely read His Word. They don't choose to follow His Word. They, they begin to think, well, that's just mere moral suggestions for my life. No, it's not. Jesus never mixed words. God's word is not something that we can just arbitrarily decide what the words mean. They have a specific meaning. This is a command that we should do these things. Why do some people not find churches to be loving places? If I, I have, I mean, I just saw a post and I was very, I'll be honest with you, as a Christian, I was very offended by the post. It wasn't from anybody at our church. It was someone who didn't go to church and hasn't been to church. And I've taught this person for many years. And, and this person uh, hasn't gone to church for many years. And, and the post said, this is why I don't go to church, because of these people. And they began to describe like church people who said these nasty things about them. And I'm going to tell you, that, that was really offensive to me. Because... One, you, you've just, you just lump this whole group of people and there's hundreds and thousands of people you never even talk to. Because these two people that they say they go to church were ugly to you, now all of a sudden we're all ugly to you and I have an issue with that. But, but I also understand that there, there has been times where people have come into churches and felt unloved and unwanted. I, I mean, anytime I go out and, and talk to people, I'll, I'll eventually run into somebody who will tell me a story like that one. Well, I used to go to church until so-and-so said this and did this, and we're so unloving. Now, I also understand a lot of times people use it as a crutch not to come back in the building. Amen? Because let me tell you, 
I, 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 t- I told one person this, uh, this way. He said, well, that person was just mean and, and ugly, and they hurt my feelings, and so I'm never going to that church again. I said, well, you still working where you're working? Because I guarantee you somebody been mean and ugly there, but you're still getting a paycheck. Amen? I'm not quitting my job because, because, because that person was ugly to me. But when one person... Get off the soapbox. Throw it away. But he says here, um, why, why do people go to church and find them unloving? Why, why, do, why, why, why is it that it's so? Well, perhaps, and here's some of the things I wrote. It, perhaps it's because we call ourselves friends of Jesus, yet we don't listen to his word. Could it be because we come on Sundays and hear his word, but we never follow his word? One of the things that, that um, is really hard for me, I'll be honest with you, it's really hard for me. I am so thankful that this church is very encouraging to me. When, I, when I'm standing out there and people walk by me, I can't tell you how many people will encourage me. I, hey, that, hey, brother, that was, that was a good word. That, was, that, that, that sermon reached me, that sermon this or that. And, and that, that, I'm telling you, I appreciate that. I really, really do. But in my heart, what I want is for me and for all of us just to follow it. Because here's the reality. Some of us will, but collectively as a whole, are we? Not because I'm preaching it. Simply because it's God's Word. Thus, we do not go and bear fruit because we're not following His Word. A church full of people uh, who don't... A church that doesn't bear fruit is a church full of people who rarely, if ever, make a difference in their community. They rarely share the gospel. It's a church who rarely, if ever, sees people receive Jesus Christ as the Savior and Lord. It's a church that rarely, if ever, fills up a baptistry. Uh, Not too too long ago, I I got to see a baptistry. And the, the, the pastor of that church apologized for the state the baptistry was in. It was dirty. There was dead bugs in it. You know why? Because it hadn't been filled in a long time. It's the reason so many churches are full of unloving people because they just don't read God's word and follow it and thus bear fruit. I, I do believe there's a lot to be said about that. And I'm just saying in my own personal life, that, that's what I've noticed in my life. Uh, years ago, when I lived by the American standard of Christianity, when I lived by the bumper sticker scripture and, and you know, it, and just got my little one verse in once, every, once, in, once in every couple of days, guys, I didn't bear much fruit. I didn't. It was when I got serious about God's Word. It's when I began to really study God's Word. Not just come and sit under a pastor and listen to His Word. Not just go to... Again, another another shameless plug. We got some great Sunday school teachers. But it wasn't just when I just went to Sunday school class. It's when I went to church, and I went to Sunday school class, and I went home, and I opened up a Bible, and I had my notes. I took notes on what that preacher said. I read what, that, what those notes were. I went back and prayed through it. I, I, I wanted the Holy Spirit to show me. Teach me. I, I, I came to a realization in my life that I didn't want to be a baby in a high chair anymore sipping up apple, applesauce. I said, Jesus, I want meat. I need meat. Help me. And I just began studying and I began learning. And you know what I started understanding? I started understanding the heart of God more. And not only that, but knowing what he wanted out of my life. And how I should, how I should live to, to obey him and, and to please him and bring him glory. And, and that just blew my mind. And I started bearing fruit. And friends, I'm not yet even close to arriving on any of that. I, I, I am honest with you completely that I have not got this on lock. I've got a lot of growth. I've got a lot to learn. But I know that, that my growth starts at the feet of Jesus with his word. I know that's where it starts. 
And, and I'm going to tell you, that there's this, also this reality for me, and I, maybe it's not true for you, but when I got serious about God's Word and studying God's Word and serious about praying and seeking the Holy Spirit to teach me God's Word and trying to live God's Word out in my life to please God, can I tell you, boy, that went really well for a while, then all of a sudden life creeps in and busyness creeps in, and you know what? Next thing I know, I realize I have not as committed as I once was. Anybody ever been there? And I said, wait a second. Why have I lost focus? I, I've got, I got my own life. I've got to go back to, to focusing. And all of this passage is wrapped around this idea is that, hey, are you willing to lay down your life for your brother, sister, brother and sister in Christ? Well, the only way you can do that the only way that's possible is if you're willing to read God's Word. Start there. Allow God, to, Jesus to teach you through His Word. Follow His Word and bear fruit. And then guess what? This, what seemed like a mountain for you, God, I don't know how I can do that, becomes a hill. And then becomes a, a, a valley. But you got to walk with the Lord. Amen. i got to walk with the Lord. I, I finish with the last verse. These things I command you so that you will love one another. I like it's like a sandwich of commandment, isn't it? Here's your commandment. Let me walk you through it. And I'm going to command you again. Here's the two slices of bread. You need to understand. Love one another. Love one another. He says, I'm your friend. And as your friend, I share these commands to you. Jesus has been teaching. He taught those in the Scripture. He teaches us now. He's teaching God's Word. Those who have studied His Word, follow His Word, learn from Jesus, those are found, begin found obediently following His Word. And those will bear fruit. And he says, in all of this, love. Now, I'm going to close up. I know today we stop to remember those who've paid the ultimate price. Those who love their friends to their own deaths. So we could have the freedom we, exhibit, we have right now. In the wars they fought, in the battles they faced, they stood side by side. I said this before, I'll repeat it. As cannon fire rang in their ears, as bullets whizzed by, they, they weren't thinking of all the reasons they disliked or even hated the soldier next to them. No, they were focused on the battle that was ahead. They were fighting for one another, looking out for one another. They had found a bond, a friendship, a brotherhood, unlike any other they had ever known, a brotherhood they'd die for. I've never experienced that closeness, but I have talked to many soldiers who have. I've even talked to some soldiers that wish they could be back on the battlefield because that, that brotherhood, that love they had, they haven't found again here. I ask you this, Christian brother and sister, can that be said of us? As we are in this battle together, fighting for the souls of the lost, fighting against the devil and his demons, fighting for Jesus, God, the Holy Spirit, and, and with his angels, so that others may hear Jesus Christ and come to know Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. As we fight shoulder to shoulder together, have we found such brotherhood, such sisterhood, that we die for? Please stand. Father, I love you so much. God, I, as I preach this sermon, um, there's just so much conviction in my life. Because I, I know me. And God, you intimately know me. You know my thoughts. Even the things that I've not said publicly, you know what I've thought privately. And God, I've laid those confessions down to you. I confess those. God, I want to love the way you have shown me to love. I want to be willing to live that agape love, that 
completely selfless, sacrificial love that you have for us. I know I can't do it without you. And I know I can only do it with you and through you. So I ask you to help me. Help me to have a passion and a fire and a desire for your word. Help me to grow in your word and bear much fruit. So I can learn to love the way you've called me to. And God, I pray for every Christian brother, sister in this room. That if that's their desire of the heart, and I pray it is. That you'd strengthen them as well. That you'd encourage them as well. That they would that you'd ignite a a fire and a passion in them to honor you by loving each other. Maybe in this sermon someone is being pulled, Jesus, to you. I pray if they've never accepted you as their Savior and Lord, they would do that today. And Holy Spirit, I just pray everything brings God glory. And I ask all this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. For the next few moments, the altar's open if you need to come forward and pray. Amen. Well, in closing, just want to say thank you so much for coming out today. I, I pray you have an amazing uh, rest of your day uh, and reflect on God's beautiful truth. And uh, enjoy tomorrow if you have an opportunity, if you have the day off and you can be with family. Please enjoy that as well, of course. Uh, don't forget a couple of quick announcements. Wednesday, this is coming up Wednesday, June 1st. Um, we're doing an outreach. It's called Dinner. Just Let Dinner Be On Us. We're going to be Across in the gravel parking lot, we're going to be um, making hamburgers and hot dogs. There'll be chips and drinks. And it's just going to be, it's all free. And we just want to let our community know that we love them, we care about them. And so if you want to be a part of that, to come and help maybe cook or, or just to come and, and sit in the chair so when people come up, just let them express to them, hey, we, we're just glad to see you. Thanks for coming out. Just to be a happy, smiling, loving face, then do that. And if you can't be here Pray for us and pray for our community. Uh, you'll see that's June 1st, 4.30 p.m. to 6.30 p.m. Thursday, June 2nd, uh, there is the Spirit Night there to support our missions. And so please, I mean, I know a lot of you like God's sanctified, ordained chicken. And so you're going to eat there anyway. So, hey, why not plan a meal and, and raise some money for missions? So that is, again, Thursday, June 2nd. Just remind them, it, remind them what it's the Spirit Night and what it's for. And they'll make sure to put that towards our mission trips here. Student Infuse, you can see that June 6th through 11th. Women's Grill Off. Women, get your grills going. Sunday, June 12th. And just take that home. Remember all of what God's doing. Love y'all. Y'all have a great weekend. Brother, will you close us?